There we go. All right. Hey guys, Steve here. Boat and Ponics. Today we're gonna to talk about go, 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 going with fishes. Going with fishes. Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing With Fishes podcast, episode 292. Uh, this uh, I'm your host Steve from Potent Ponics, and this week we have Cass from Cognitive Function. Thanks for joining us so much this week. Heck yeah, and 292, that's a good one. I was born in 1992, so look at that. Synchronicity. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Letting everybody know how old I am. About to make my 30th turn around the sun. <laughs> It's all right. It gets scarier after that. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people are like, are you looking forward to it? And I'm like, I mean, I guess my mom's Asian. So she's had me feeling like I'm 30 for the past five years. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, for those of you that haven't joined us before, this is a, um, you know, regenerative living soil and aquaponic podcast that also touches on cannabis, cannabis culture, as well as uh, episodes like this that also touch on different types of plant medicines and, and other types of uh, uh, options for people that are in that same kind of realm. Um, this week, we're going to talk about mushrooms. Um, we haven't really had much uh, content on that before, uh, although they're not the ones that you're thinking of, I think, um, uh, offhand. Uh, so uh, don't get too excited if that's what you thought you're you're going to listen to today. But uh, we do have a bunch of really cool uh, mushroom medicine talk to ha- to talk about today with uh, with Cass. Um, for those of you that haven't uh, uh, checked us out before, you can also find out more info at apmjclass.com. Marty and I, the co-host of the show, oh, uh, got the wrong setting. Always screw this part up. There we go. Um, <laughs> Uh, we do have a full online class. Uh, if you want to learn more about aquaponic cannabis, uh, it has over 700 lectures. Uh, we talk about pretty much everything. I have a whole new revamp for the pest control that's going to be going out uh, for the class as well. And I'm almost done uh, uh, redoing. Um, I would not know there's anything wrong with the old version, but uh, the new version is uh, just that part of it is over 200 slides. So um I think you guys are really going to like it. And uh, it's kind of a little bit more in-depth uh, than, than the, what we used to have on there, which was still about 100 and some slides, but um, we kind of go over a little bit more detail than that. We're also going to be offering the pest management portion of the class as a separate shorter class as well uh, here in a couple of weeks. So uh, definitely look out for that. Uh, we'll have some more info on that as we get closer, but uh, that is also in the works uh, as well because we do have a lot of requests for that uh, separately. So Alrighty, um, now that we got the housekeeping out of the way, um, thanks for joining us this week, Cass. Um, uh, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself and, and what you do? You have an amazing company called Cognitive Function. You, know, you have uh, some festivals coming up. You do all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff. Uh, um, yeah, tell us about yourself and what you, you're about. Yeah, thank you so much for for having me on. I know we've been trying to do this for months, so I'm glad that it's finally worked out. Uh, my name is Cassandra Posey, and I am the founder of Cognitive Function. This beautiful website was just redone, and I'm so proud of it. Uh, I feel like it it has such a cool look to it. Um, I started Cognitive Function back in 2018. I had been on pharmaceuticals for ADHD, depression, and anxiety for about 17 years of my life from the age of nine to uh, 25. I put this super long bio in here because people have been asking for it for a long time. So if you made it through that whole bio on my website, uh, thank you so much for for having the patience to read my vulnerable story. Um, So back in 2018, I was 25 years old and I was really struggling, um, you know, with, uh, with life and the approach that I was taking. I was working a a really um, hectic job, uh, putting in, you know, more hours than I needed to every day. And I was on um, Vyvanse for ADHD and uh, different medications for anxiety and depression as well. Um, And I kind of just hit a point where I was like, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. I can't do it anymore. And I had been obsessed with diet and nutrition ever since I was little. Um, and I had tried so many different diets out there and came across, um, I don't know if you're familiar, Steve, but you might be, um, 
uh, Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride's work. She wrote the GAPS book, um, Gut and Psychology Syndrome, and it really focuses on full fats. Her son had autism and she was able to really minimize symptoms by moving out onto the land and cooking all of his meals in house and a lot of homesteading and a lot of really understanding healthy animal fats. I was vegan at the time, so totally rocked my world, but I was willing to give it a try um, because of how badly I was struggling. And I kind of took her approach and then started adding medicinal mushrooms into the full fats. So one of my first products was a uh, cordyceps ghee, and that's still part of the line today uh, that we sell at Cognitive Function. Um, it's a seasonal product now because I really like to use that summer butter. It's the most tasty dec decadent butter. Um, and then we also carry a vegan option as well, which is coconut oil, MCT oil, and uh, mushrooms. And then um, as, you know, that really healed my, my brain and my gut, I started traveling around, becoming completely obsessed with mushroom cultivation and sourcing as a whole. Um, cognitive function, I aim solely at transparency. Um, you know, if I'm not putting it in my body, I'm not promoting it. And I work with a lot of mothers out there. So it's a really big thing to them as well. Um, and so I've met tons of amazing folks along the way, and I support solely U.S. cultivators, um, farms that I've walked through, people that I've met along the way, and that, you know, we use our dollars at Cognitive Function to support, um, to bring the best medicine and best transparency to the marketplace. Um, I now have, I think I've got five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten SKUs total. I, I kind of alter because I do some CSA items along the way too, but we've got a whole tincture line. We've got a whole food is medicine line. Um, and if you're not familiar, you should definitely check it out. Um, and shoot me a DM if you ever want to talk about protocols for ADHD, depression, or anxiety, because that is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what kind of got you into um, wanting to start your own company as far as uh, what kind of made you take that leap into trying to create the medicines for other people? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was, I guess, trying to really create a sustainable approach for my life. And my, my thought process was, okay, well, Cass, you can, you can get off the meds, but how do you stay off of them? And so for me, it was carving out that um, that system to, you know, help the adrenals get back into balance and help manage the stress. But also, you know, I needed to figure out how to be my own boss and go out in the woods if I needed a break from, from the hustle and bustle. And if I need to be depressed and lay in bed all day on a Tuesday and not answer emails, then that's just what I'm going to do. So I think it was a part of that trying to create a sustainable lifestyle for myself. And then it was also me being fueled by what was currently on the marketplace. And when I was trying to um, help myself and come back to baseline, a lot of the mushroom products that I had found on the market were all doo-doo. Like <laughs> I started researching and looking into them and I'm like, hold on, this is just myceliated biomass, which for anybody out there listening who is like, what does that mean? Um, it's essentially when you're cultivating mushrooms, you're growing them on a substrate and the organism exists on that substrate. Um, so it's a cheap way to make medicine because you can pretty much run it on different types of starches. One of them being brown rice. That's usually what mushrooms are typically cultivated on. Um, when we're talking about myceliated biomass and for me, I just kind of got to the point where I was like, I want a full spectrum product here and I want something that actually works. And um, yeah, there's a good picture. That's an excellent one to pull up. So you've got the mycelium, which is all of that white, beautiful fluffiness floating around. And then the fruiting body of this is an oyster mushroom, looks like a blue oyster mushroom. Um, that fruiting body is what's sitting on top, that actual more mushroom looking shape that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, and I, I really wanted something that combined both of them. Uh, and then I got obsessed with uh, cannabis extractions and trying to learn more about different ways to, to, to push the solvents to really be working for us. And 
Um, yeah, look at how cool mycelium is. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, they're coming out with so many different kits, um, which I'll talk about the festival in a little while, but um, there'll be somebody there that's going to be showing us how to make myceliated pots to grow plants out of and stuff. And I'm super stoked on that. Um, but yeah, to loop back around, I wanted something that was full spectrum on the market. So uh, that was a big play. And then also being able to really push the extract game and, and really like hone in on that. And how can we best um, how can we best utilize the solvents to pull out all the constituents we need? And, you know, how do we make it so that it's not degraded by heat, um, all these different components. So that's kind of what I've spent the last five years working on and being excited about. And for me, it was just that whole sustainable approach of business. Like, how do we make it so that I can exist and be happy and, and not get back on the pharmaceuticals? So every day is like, a fresh day I wake up and I'm stoked because I've been off the meds since 2018, which is probably the biggest accomplishment of my life. Awesome. Um, what are some of the different misconceptions and things that you often hear about uh, mushroom based medicines that you think maybe are, are some barriers that people uh, uh, to getting into and, uh, and approaching this type of medicine? I think the biggest one is people are always like, am I going to get high? And then, you know, you have to have that conversation, which is like, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a valid, it's, it's a super valid question, but there's just such a misconception around like, either am I going to get high or how do you know it's not poisonous to which I'm like, I don't know, man, I've been doing this for a little while. If it's poisonous, like, you know, that'd be a whole other story. But, uh, but yeah, so I put kind of like an FAQ section on the website just to try to give a little bit more transparency to customers, because that's, that's the question I get a lot. Um, and I work at the Ballard Farmers Market out here in Seattle. If you guys are local to the area, that's where I reside. And um, I, you know, I have people come up all the time. They're like, so are these going to get me high? Or are these the fun mushrooms? And I'm like, they're all fun, first and foremost. And second of all, if they could get you high, it might be making more money than I am right now. Um, so those are probably the misconceptions we have. And I also urge people to, I'm like, if you want to learn more about identification and get excited about that, the, um, you know, we host classes. I say we a lot, but it's really me behind the brand. Um, but I try to get my friends out as much as possible and host mushroom and plant walks. Um, and with cognitive function, I've really just aimed for it to be an education first company. So trying to put as much out there as possible, you know, to the capacity that I have and the resources I have um, and, and really just get everybody excited and educated because if you can be educated on um, things you've got so much more of a, a deeper understanding of how to operate your body and this, you know, human bio instrument, as I once heard, I love that term. What are some of the different mushrooms that you're using, uh, um, for your different types of, uh, products? So you have cordyceps and lion's mane and turkey tail and reishi, um, can you yeah, tell us yeah. a little about some of those different ones? Maybe starting off with uh, with cordyceps, because I think cordyceps is one of the coolest ones. A lot of people don't really realize uh, that uh, cordyceps not only are really healthy for you, but they're also kind of becoming more and more used in, in, in large scale agriculture as a biocontrol and kind of helping us get away from chemicals as well. So they really are a wonderful group of mushrooms. And I know when I was down in Peru, it was so cool to see how everything, all the different insect species in the jungle down there in the Amazon had different cordyceps mushrooms that helped balance out the different uh, things so that nothing was too overpopulated. And you'd find grasshoppers with all kinds of funky stuff and a tarantula with all kinds of funky stuff growing out of it. And a katydid with all kinds of funky stuff growing out of it. And it was kind of the way that everything kind of achieved balance. If there's too much of a population, the fungi wipe them out and it kind of brings balance. Yep. Back. It really it's made like a lot of sense to see it on that scale, you know? That is so cool. I am like, I'm so jealous that you are envious, I guess is the word that you got to have that experience. They're such little, little, uh, bio regulators. Like I cordyceps first and foremost have been the biggest love affair of my life. Like most consistent, like out the gate, not just because they're an aphrodisiac, which they are, but also just because like, I, 
every day feel like I wake up and I serve the cordyceps mushroom. <laughs> like I feel like they're my they're my uh they're my the thing that I uh I bow down to. I feel like, you know, they really saved my life with the the properties they have for energy. Um, and I'll run in the back and grab some extracts in a little bit so we can look at them together. But um cordyceps were really what got me through trying to get off of the um, more, more people are probably familiar with Adderall, but I was on Vivance. Um, and so, yeah, they really helped me get off of that and rebalance my immune system. Um, but the way they grow in the wild, kind of like C was saying, yep, there's one right there. Um, I actually have a tattoo of it too, which is kind of a good learning tool, but essentially the spores will fall. The spores will fall on the mushroom right here or sorry on the bug so this one is a wasp and it will lead it to completely twitch out and be like completely brain controlled and it will it'll lead the 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 organism the bug it'll lead the bug to go and die usually they they bury themselves sometimes they're on leaves and then once they've died and the fungus has myceliated the substrate the substrate being the bug the uh, mushroom will will fruit out of its brain, which is so epic. Um, I love them for that. I feel like that's me. I feel like the cordyceps fruited out of my brain and that's my natural state now. <laughs> and, but yeah, Paul Stamets has been doing a lot of work with um, using them as a bioregulator. Yeah, look at that. So I think that's an ant. Is that an ant? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. what's crazy is too a lot of these are here's a tarantula yeah i've seen that one that one's so crazy yeah so these are all different types of cordyceps um they all have different obviously each um different strains um but the one that we primarily work with is um cordyceps militaris um which is commonly there you go there it is there she blow yeah and you can do all sorts of different stuff with these too like that's probably a more commercial strain of cordyceps and you can tell because that looks like it's been bred specifically for its genetics of being more like thin and noodly and tall um but we you know pull these out of the wild and clone them in the lab and try to breed them for different um, uses and, and try to get that stuff tested and see, you know, which ones are producing which compounds at, at which higher rate. So cordycepin is usually what we're looking for. Um, cordycepin is uh, very similar to something your body, a compound your body um already makes naturally called adenosine triphosphate ATP if you're familiar um, ATP is a free energy source so when you ingest cordyceps cordycepin goes into your body on a cellular level and it's actually able to give you um, just natural sustained energy so that's why we really like cordyceps look at that that's so sick um that's why we really like cordyceps and um, they're just able to do so much for us. They've been used in traditional Chinese medicine for ages, but they're becoming more and more popular here um, in the U.S. I think the next popular one is lion's mane. A lot of people are pretty obsessed with lion's mane right now um, as it pertains to stacking it with other substances, um, but also because it helps to... Um, really create neuroplasticity in the brain. Um, lion's mane has this really cool cascading effect on some of the um, specific um, species of lion's mane. Um, let's see which one Steve's going to pull up. Yeah, look at that one's cool. And then type in heresium um, choroloides. See, type in choroloides because that one has a different kind of vibe to it, which is cool. Uh, 
How do you spell that one? C O R D I Coroloides. I have no idea. I have dyslexia. All right. Well, I'll, I'll figure that out here. In the, <laughs> See, I can, um, maybe I can find it and put it in the chat. But um, <laughs> the reason why I like that one, too, I mean, there's just so many different. Sure it's we'll yeah, there. it's it's C-O-R-A-L-L-O-I-D-E-S. B O R A L L. D. Yeah. E S. Did you find it? I just came up with a bunch of coral pictures. Oh, I'll, oh, here. I'll send you a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's cool for people to see because there's so many different variations that it's like, that's what. I feel like it's so trippy about mushrooms is people are like, did it pull? Yeah. Yeah. See, there you go. There's so many different variations. And like one of the first times I was looking for lion's mane, I saw, you know, this Coraloide species. And I was like, there's no way that's lion's mane, you know, but it's like, that's yeah, totally lion's mane. Um, it looks like coral and it's named after that. So they have all sorts of different, um, you know expressions depending on different um different strains it's pretty cool super neat um, wow. but yeah this this is something that i'd be interested more in um really yeah look at that's so pretty i'd be <laughs> really interested in um you know testing more of these compounds in these different um variations and then seeing you know like which which is more um, helpful for anxiety, which is more helpful for depression, you know, and being able to have some sort of um, gauge around that um, would be super cool. There's that. still so uh, so much that we don't know about what um, different compounds that these mushrooms make. There's so many different complex compounds that are uh, not found anywhere else in, in nature and some of their different abilities. I mean, they found mushrooms inside the reactor at Chernobyl to help clean up uh, uh, the radiation there. It started to evolve to eat radiation. They're talking about using that to clean up different waste sites for weapon stuff and all that kind of stuff for the military and as well as different waste from different facilities from power plants and stuff like that. So uh, there's so many different aspects to it that uh, are, are just well beyond anything else um, in, in terms of the nature, natural world. I went to the office to grab some of these. I think I've showed you these before, but these are the these are the extracts that um, I work with specifically for cognitive functions products. So this is um, this is concentrated cordyceps. So you can see how um, how rich in color it is. Um, really, the amount of um, we try to do as, as least heat as possible, but kind of like you're saying, it's like they have so many different uses and how can we be able to get the compounds to express fully? You know, um, when I first started working on this project, I was like, okay, well, cordyceps are super thin and fragile, you know, for the most part, like they don't need 212 degree Fahrenheit boiling water poured all over them. Like, I don't think they like that very much, but chaga on the other hand, like is super dense and needs way more heat um, to be able to fully express and to fully decoct. So, you know, here's the chaga, for example, it's like all balled up and it's much different, but yeah, this is lion's mane, which interesting because it's very brown i know we've talked about trying to run some extractions together so we'll have to get that popping yeah definitely have to run a couple of the rounds of those yeah <laughs> here's some um, cordyceps but these have been um probably these have been sun sun tanned a little bit They've they they looks like they've lost their color a little. <laughs> but I usually put these on my table so people can see. 
people can see what things look like. Um, we haven't talked yet about uh, turkey tails and rishis, which are some of the other ones that you have in your your yeah. Various- yeah, so turkey tail is a mushroom that has received a lot of um, press around its cancer fighting properties or abilities. I don't make any claims at all, but um, it's full of um, different compounds to help the body uh, deal with the stress management um, of cancer and the way that that is attacking your system. Um so I've, I've heard a lot of people having, not a lot, but like a lot of the studies that have come out have been more successful with turkey tail. I personally really like turkey tail as a digestive um, support. It really helped my digestive system. And I make a blend with turkey tail, um, milk thistle seed, licorice root, burdock root, and dandelion. And um that blend is called the alchemize it's usually always sold out on the site but um it's because i really only use wild crafted turkey tail so sometimes when it's out it's out but that blend specifically made for um processing um your hormones in your liver and just as basic liver detoxification but i find that um because that turkey tail is in there it just really helps with the digestive system and it feels really good um is it on there i also put the turkey tail in um there it is turkey tail alchemize yeah i also put it in the defense blend which is the one that's right next to it the defense blend has a little bit of all the mushrooms that i work on so all six mushrooms and then as you just hovered over it, you can see I put the um, anatomy of the body on all the bottles. So um, being more neurodivergent, I wanted to have a visual component on all the bottles so that like anybody can pick it up and take a look at it and you can have the communication that way where you don't necessarily have to read it. You can just understand visually what, what it means. Um, so they all have different thing so cordyceps great for the lungs and for the adrenals turkey tails more um and the the flow that you just went over is more for nervous system and um lungs so yeah i mean that's i like that uh concept it makes it a lot simpler for people to understand that's really neat yeah my ex-partner had a young son too and so there was a part of me that was like i want like a five-year-old to be able to grab this off the shelf and know what it is and not necessarily have to read the label. Um, I just, I love the concept of, of really being able to communicate via symbols. I feel like that's one of the biggest things that the mushrooms have, have taught me is communication and communication via symbol. Like lion's mane, for example, it looks like a brain. It's good for your brain. You know, nature's handing us these things on a silver platter. It's like, here, this is good for you. Here's what it's good for, you know? So yeah, just really trying to work with them in that way and help them express to the best of their capabilities. Um, And then reishi mushroom, I think was, yep. were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say about reishi. <laughs> mm-hmm. Reishi mushrooms, amazing. And if you don't want to take a tincture of it, I mean, most people do because it's very bitter, but I think that's why I like it so much. I think that we need more bitters in our diet um, in the US particularly, but that's a mushroom that I keep on the stove just or on a, in a crock pot, just decocting all the time. Sometimes I'll add some chaga in there as well. And you can just leave that thing going for a couple of weeks on low and just keep refilling the um, water. Always use filtered water. I use a Berkey at my house. Um, And if it's too bitter tasting for you, my hot tip is to um, add it to your, use it as your coffee water. So if you've got like a coffee maker at home, you can just pour that mushroom tea into your coffee maker and let it pull that through your, um, ground coffee beans. And then you can drink it and it really masks that flavor. Um, 
but if you're bold enough to try it, I highly recommend. I feel like when I drink reishi tea, it kind of just like cleanses my palate a little bit. Um, it definitely makes you crave sugar less. It's great for the nervous system. It's great for the lungs, the liver. Um, it's known as the mushroom of immortality. So yeah, I mean, who doesn't want that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I know there's certainly documentation for Rishis going back at least, uh, was it four or 6,000 years in Chinese medicine? Um, you know, I think the first, one of the first writings is the same one that was the first writing about medicinal properties of cannabis uh, in Chinese medicine as well in the same book. So uh, a lot of these things have a very uh, intertwined history when it comes to uh, healing people and, you know, being of the same culture even thousands of years ago. Absolutely. I think cannabis and mushrooms go hand in hand also, just as a sidebar. <laughs> I think that they like want to be together. And um, I mean, we've talked about this before, but like in cannabis grows, like trying to have little mushrooms fruiting out of the living soil is like a goal. Um, I used mushroom blocks a couple grows back just to put on top of the soil as like a mulch instead of straw just for an indoor grow in uh, my two by two that I might have in my my closet um just to see what would happen it definitely dries out a little more it doesn't mulch as well but um you know it's fun to just kind of experiment I bet Steve's gonna pull up a really cool picture in a second <laughs> um and to like, if you are gardening at home and um, you you want to start growing mushrooms because you're fascinated by it, even if you pick up a grow kit online and you fruit it out a couple of times, you can use that block once it's done to add it to your compost um, and add it to your beds and it, it'll do wonders for your garden. I was... Uh, oh. Oh, oh, my mic is not muted. Um, I was going to pull up some mushrooms in the garden of, of uh, some commercial grows that I've been working on uh, just to kind of show that, you know, they do grow really well together. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Bottom of the pot there. <laughs> Those guys are cute. That looks like a little Mika cap. I wonder what that is. Hold on. I got a lot bigger ones here. Me two seconds to find them while we're we're chatting. Um, well, uh, you also are, are passionate about wild mushroom foraging. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, that I feel like is a big part of just the uh, medicine in itself is like, how, how often can you get out um, into the forest and look around? Um, a good friend of mine, the other day, he said, I judge my wealth by the amount of days I get to go mushroom hunting a year. And I was like, I feel that. Um, it's like so true. Like how many days do you get to take off and like just go run around the forest barefoot, you know, and like look at cool stuff and um, find some mushrooms. Um, I'm in the Pacific Northwest now, like I mentioned, and here we get like so many seasons of mushrooms. Like I feel so blessed and spoiled up here. I'm like, Really, anytime you run into the woods, you're going to find something. Um, we, have, we have a lot of red belted polypore around here. Um, that's probably the most common mushroom that I find. Oh, yeah. I love this picture. Look at how cute. I love that. It looks so good. What, um, what strain um, is that plant? Do you know? Do you remember? I think you're muted. This particular one was either hash plant or um, I forget what purple something else that we had out there. I don't mm, remember. Yeah, exactly. I see some purple in it. Those are cool. Yeah, we get all kinds of good stuff when you're dosing with IMO and you're yeah. really getting wild spores in your your soil. Like all of these are in the same facility. We had probably. 30 different species of mushrooms that were blooming like every morning when you came out there was a bunch of mushrooms that had bloomed overnight and then you'd have like a new batch every day which was like super exciting it was like going out seeing what what popped up today when you're scouting out the mutton the grow it was really fun <laughs> imo imo will change your life 
IMO. Yeah, that's where it all starts. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, but yeah, so I feel like trying to get outside as much as possible is the biggest thing. And um I I feel like I've been finding so much red belted polypore lately that maybe that's gonna have to be the next tincture that comes out. Um if I release another one, I've got five right now. And it's, it's like having five children, like the stock is low. I've got to make more. And I still make everything by hand by myself. So it's a lot of work, but uh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, def I definitely feel you there. I, uh, I did that for the edible business down here and it certainly is a similar deal. You can only make so much in a day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, do people want to come hang out, have a party and help me bottle all this stuff? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beer and pizza, fill some bottles. Yeah. No, my fr I have the best friends though. They'll, they'll do it. They'll like pull those late nights with me to help out. <laughs> um, what are some of the other ones that you like to forage? I know um, I'm going mushroom hunting on Sunday. If anyone is in the OKC area and interested, they can definitely hit me up on Instagram. Um, me and Jordan River are going out on, on Sunday to go look for some uh, early season chanterelles. I know the cinnabars and the, the yellow chanterelles should be popping. We have a little bit of a heat wave the next couple of days, so I think it should get it moving after about five days of straight rain. So I'm pretty sure we'll yeah. do our <laughs> You're going to do just fine. And you better send me all the pictures because that's going to be so amazing. Um, well, right now over here, we still have morels popping off. So I need to get out. I need to take a little time. Um, I think I'm going to probably go in the next couple of weeks and go camp and look for morels and and spend some time doing that. But I haven't had much time lately. I'm like also in the process of planning this festival, which I thought was a great idea. And it is a great idea, but it's a lot of work. So I haven't had much time to go look for mushrooms. <laughs> I feel you. Yeah. Um, for anyone uh, listening to the show, between like six and 8,000 feet, you should be about starting to find them now. Uh, I know in Colorado, we used to find them, you know, third, four, third or fourth week of May. Uh, is when we start to find the black ones and uh, black morels and we'd find them all the way through June and even into early July uh, up in the higher elevations. So definitely uh, a pastime of mine. I certainly miss uh, running through the quaking aspens and stuff and, you know, and running into moose every time we'd ever gotten to a close <laughs> encounter and almost getting attacked. It was always during morel season. You know, yeah. The patch of willows or something and it stands up in front of you and you're like, oh, shit. You know, <laughs> anyone that goes hunting has the best morale spots. Like those are the people you need to make friends with. Like, and they won't tell you about it. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> you got to go, you got to go look for people who, who, who are out there all the time. Cause they'll have some spots, but we drove by some area the other day and I'm like, Oh, it looks like a burn. I need to get out of the car really quick. And I'm like, you know, I'm constantly looking for mushrooms. This, this was our holiday. Oh, look at that. Day. These are some yellows and then a, a false morel. You can yeah. eat most of these, by the way. A lot of people think you can't eat them. Some of them absolutely can make you sick, like in Colorado, a higher altitude than you can. But in Oklahoma, most of the species actually are edible. You just have to make sure you thoroughly cook them. So um, they're, they're called beef steaks uh, to some you know, some parts of the country. So uh, definitely make sure you get proper ID on it. iNaturalist is a really good resource. Uh, Mushroom yeah. Observer is another good one. Uh, if you're looking for resources they're so cool i mean i love cutting them open too and they're hollow on the inside and they just look like it just looks like a palace you know like looks like some sweet mansion for a bug uh i like to imagine things as like smaller like you know uh ecosystems and i mean the brain can wander I create cool stories in my head um but when they're hollow too, it's a great um, opportunity for chefs. Uh, you can shove cheese in it <laughs> and cook them. Look, those look so great. I love yeah. mushroom. Even a bad day mushroom hunting is a day in the woods, you know? 
<laughs> oh, absolutely. I'm like, even if I'm not coming back with anything, I'm coming back with just like a smile on my face from being outside and getting some sort of microbes in my, my nose and my eyes and on my hands. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Um, um, so what is, uh, some of the different best ways to consume these different, uh, types of, um, uh, mushroom medicines, you know, and it, you've talked a little bit about tinctures and a little bit about fats and stuff. What are some of the other ways that you found that are, you know, uh, some of the best ways to really get the best efficacy or, or you found? Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, if you can just get more mushrooms in your diet, that's huge. So, um, finding either joining a mycological society and getting out and starting to learn different IDs and, and getting out with your community and um, harvesting your own mushrooms out of the woods um, and trying to get more wild foods into your diet is so big anyways. Um, but if that's not really uh, an option for you right now, another great solution is <clears throat> starting to go to your farmer's market and seeing, you know, if you have a local mushroom grower um, in your area um, or hit me up and I, I might know somebody who's close by to you um, and support them and try to just make different dishes with mushrooms in them. Um, that's a really good way. Uh, and making teas is also brilliant. I love just being able to have mushroom tea all the time and you can add whatever you want into it. Like um, the more the merrier in, in that, in that regard, I do reishi, red belted polypore, turkey tail, chaga, sometimes even shiitake, lion's mane. I had some oyster buds the other day and I threw them in there too. Um, and I just keep it going and try to drink it throughout the day, keep the immune system healthy, keep the lungs feeling good. Um, and then, yeah, if you're at home and you like the concept that, I started doing, you know, um, that I sell like my brain lube, that's just coconut oil, lion's mane and MCT oil. And that's something that you could try to whip up, um, on your own too. Uh, when I first started doing it, I was doing it with just uh, fruiting bodied mushrooms. So, um, now it's got the extracts in it, but you know, you could dehydrate your own lion's mane and try to mix it into uh, full fat as well. And, and add that into whatever you're cooking. Um, I really enjoy it in, in a little bit of bone broth um, or on top of my oatmeal in the morning if I have oatmeal. But um, yeah, those are all great ways to do it. Um, I've got on the stove right now some beautiful cacao from Ecuador that I just mixed um, two ounces of reishi lion's mane honey into so that's going to go in a in a nice little jar for later um just so that i can kind of microdose you know a nice blend um throughout the week and you know you can use that in in whatever application you want you can eat it out of the jar or you can add it to your coffee uh, i really like to make things that um you can try to add into your daily routine so that you're able to be a little bit more consistent and you can dose yourself throughout the day to really stay on top of the medicine in that way. Those are really great tips. Um, <laughs> uh, so you have an upcoming event uh, uh, that you're putting together. Do you want to talk about that? Heck yes. I want to talk about that. I'm so excited and you're, you're going to come out, right? Hopefully. Yep. I'm hoping to. Yep. Okay, good. Um, yeah, Steve's going to be there. Our really good friend Chris Trump is also going to be there. He's going to drop some deep KNF knowledge on everybody. Um, also, Matt Powers, hopefully, is going to come out. Um, if you know his work, he's the permaculture student on Instagram. Um, and then uh, I'll be speaking as well, and we'll have a bunch of other people out in the mycological realm. Um coming out to teach about, you know, mushroom cultivation, a good friend of mine, um, Mendo Maiko, he's going to be out speaking about, uh, single use plastics and, uh, zero waste in mushroom cultivation. That's going to be an amazing class. Um, we're going to have a whole little, um, round table discussion on home birth as well, because I feel like that's a really important topic. Um, and for any women, 
uh, listening. We're also going to have a whole women's studies class, which is going to be cool. We're going to have general homesteading, so soap making. Uh, we're going to have a butchery class as well. So it's called Myceliate. You can find more information at myceliatethefestival.com. Um, it's going to be all mushrooms and permaculture focused. It's on 400 acres out here in the Seattle area. And if you um, are flying in, you can hop on one of our shuttle buses to get to the, there we go, the little flyer that I made. We're going to talk about cannabis too. Um, yeah. So if you hop on a plane and you arrive at the SeaTac airport, we're more than happy to pick you up. We've got um, a huge um, cabin situation. So you can either do general camping and bring your own tent or car camp or load up an RV and come. There's hookups or you can um, bunk up in one of the cabins um, as well. So it's just like going to summer camp when you were little um, and it's going to be a really great experience and you'll meet so many cool new people and um, I'm really stoked for it. Uh, I'm hoping to get three to 500 people out this year. Meals are included. Um, and I can't, yeah, that's, I can't say any more about it. I'm just so excited. I'm like, I want everyone in one place. I think that's the biggest aspect of it. It's really going to be a skill share. So trying to, you know, come and gain knowledge in ecological literacy and being able to take that back home to our local communities and amplify, you know, communal abundance together is really the goal with this thing. So it's completely self-funded by me. Buy a ticket, support, come out, <laughs> see all your friends. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. Uh, certainly I'm looking forward to that. And, uh, Certainly a great excuse to get the hell out of Oklahoma during the hottest part of the year. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but definitely uh, uh, looking forward to that. Always fun to hang out with Chris and uh, be really neat to, to meet you in person. We've uh, been interacting for quite a while. And uh, I know it's so crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I know you so well. And I'm like, we've never even met in person. It's so wild. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, me too. Um, yeah. So we have, uh, let me make sure. I, oh, um, did you want to, we had one other question that I was kind of hoping to, or one other series of questions I was kind of hoping to ask you about a little bit. And I know you kind of mentioned that you uh, maybe haven't done it quite as recently, but um, yeah. do you have any advice for people that are maybe like super excited about this? They want to maybe try and grow some of their own stuff at home. Like what are some good resources or good ways for they to get into it? And then what are some of the best species to start off with? Uh, if they're yeah, looking totally. to kind of learn the science. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd say come to my Celiate the Festival August 19th through the 21st to learn about cultivation. Um, but also, uh, you know, depending upon your area, there are so many different teachers um, that you can find. So I try to, I try to go that route. Um, also on YouTube. So depending upon what species you're trying to grow, if you're trying to do something that's not necessarily in the magic zone, um, I would definitely lean towards an oyster strain. They're super resilient. Um, they're a fun one to grow. I feel like you really get to know about mushrooms when you start to cultivate oysters. Um, they're very forgiving and they're excited to be invited to the party. So, and they taste great. So, um, I I'd definitely probably start with an oyster. Um, it's an easy one to do. And you could, if you've got, you know, like a home scale garden, um, you could easily uh, just pasteurize some straw and try to inoculate it with a grow kit of sorts. And you could be growing mushrooms up and fast, quick and dirty with not a whole lot of input um, costs and energy. Um, if you're looking to do, you know, something a little bit more. Yep. There you go. Um, if you're looking to start really getting into it, I'd recommend um, checking out a class. If you're in the Seattle area, I do cultivation classes um, quarterly um, where we do different species and we talk about different ways to grow mushrooms. Um, but you'd really want to look into getting like a still air box or a flow hood of sorts so that you have a clean environment to work from to really be working with different mushroom cultures and being able to amplify your grow in that way. Um, 
So yeah, I hope that that's enough information. If you start getting really excited and you go down a rabbit hole and you start producing a ton of mushrooms, get in contact with me and we'll get you, I'll come tour the farm and buy back whatever you grow so that I can uh, make more medicine with it. So it's good incentive. It's a great incentive. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, if anyone has any questions in chat, um, throw them up in the chat here. We'll, we'll add them to the queue. Um, uh, we, do you have any other tips or tricks for mushroom hunting? Uh, I can definitely share mine. So um, the best things that you guys can do is look up online for a rain shadow map uh, and then look at the three day and five day previous rain shadows. And that's where you want to go because that's where it's rained in the last three to five days. If you're looking for a quarter inch or more of rain, ideally, um, if you really want to get good flushes, a uh, half inch or more is, is even better. And then also look at what side of the mountains or area that you're looking at is it south facing, north facing, because that'll change the temperature of the ground. Uh, a lot of mush, most mushrooms that we're hunting are associated with uh, plant roots or tree roots or bush roots or, or some other root system. Uh, and that's the reason why they're wild for, for, for harvested instead of cultivated. Uh, a lot of those really can't be done artificially yet. Uh, or, you know, our understanding of it is still very infantile compared to some other, other areas of cultivation. So um, you want to look for the species of trees that are associated with the stuff that you're looking for. For instance, I'm, I'm looking for lodge poles if I'm looking for um, a porcinis up in Colorado, or I'm looking for more aspen pine mix if I'm looking for chanterelles, or not chanterelles, uh, uh, morels, uh, and then uh, you know deciduous trees more for chanterelles. Um, but the real hack and the thing that I've really learned, and I learned this from a guy at the Colorado Mycological Society, and this hands down, if you combine this with uh, rain shadows, and then a little bit of documentation on your end, you'll end up way better harvests is take a meat thermometer, a digital meat <laughs> thermometer out into the forest, stick it into the ground about three or two to three inches down and measure the temperature. Once you start finding the mushrooms that you're after, uh, and, and you can figure out what the exact temperature is to trigger that fruiting bodies in the, in the my mycelium in your local area for your species that you're targeting in that, in that local mountain or, or valley or whatever. So by, by doing that, you can map it out. So you can go to the area, stick your thermometer ground and be like, nope, we're early or we're late. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's whatever, or move on to the next spot because half of mushroom hunting is moving on to spots that are more productive and off of the stuff that isn't so being able to keep moving and keep harvesting really saves you a lot of time and that's really once i started combining that with the rain shadow maps i it's just been a, a huge huge difference in terms of daily yields when i do go out hunting you just gave them all the sauce i was gonna say <laughs> know your treat that was where i was gonna <laughs> gonna go yeah that everything that steve just said he just he just laid it down 100 <laughs> percent um and yeah i think like getting getting tree identification books is super huge because of the symbiotic relationships um and then it's a twofer because you really get to learn about you know even more about your ecosystem with with different trees in your your region which is super important um and then once you start learning about that too it starts to make cultivation easier because you're about to understand more about which mushrooms like to grow you know closer to which strains and and whatnot um which is huge um and then iNaturalist is a great tip if you're just starting out um there are also a lot of really great mushroom growing or mushroom um groups on facebook uh which you can, most of them are public or it's easy to hop into them. Um, and yep, there's iNaturalist. Um, and a lot of that community will really help you out. Um, for the most part, I know that like my colleges sometimes seem a little daunting, but uh, everybody's really just here continuing to try to learn and, and, and wants to push forward, you know, the beautiful medicine that it is to get out and look at things and um, be excited about it. So make friends. The other tip that I was going to give is um, if you have children or you know of where you can f acquire a child uh, to hang out with for the day in the not creepy sense, um, bring them because they're lower to the ground. So sometimes their eyes can see things that you can't see, <laughs> which is great. And they have a blast being out there too. So those are my tips. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
And you can set the filters on this to be like whatever you want. So if you just want to look for snakes or amphibians or reptiles, amphibians, birds, mushrooms, plants, insects. Um, I like it a lot when I'm doing consulting. If I've never seen an insect and it's on a pl outdoor plants before, I can at least get an idea of what it is. You know, is it a friend? Is it a foe? Um, you know, is it uh, something I need to worry about getting bitten or stung by? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but especially if you've never, you're really trying to learn just, hey, what are the plants and animals in my yard or in the park or forest near me? It's one of the best resources out there and it's all, you know, crowdsourced. So you can report stuff on there and submit it and be part of that as well. Um, and, you know, so definitely something fun to do with kids if you're looking for education options and stuff like that. It's a, a lot of fun. And uh, one of the best resources out there. And then I really like Mushroom Observer. I've used that quite heavily as well in terms of trying to get final IDs on stuff. I don't know if you've used that website as well. Yeah, Mushroom Observer is great. They have extensive amounts of information on bolites, which is I mean, you can go down that rabbit hole also. Yeah. You, you'd be in 3 a.m. in bed, like just looking through all the Boletus <laughs> genus. Like <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> or you, some of them are strange too, because like so in Colorado, you have the aspen, the aspen mushrooms, aspen boletes, which are normally and everywhere else in the US perfectly safe to eat in certain ground conditions or there's some type of certain subspecies that's toxic and it makes gives people pretty bad gastrointestinal issues like it's, yeah. it's whereas normally it's edible you know and so you do have some weird populations even within species that are just against the grain which is why it's always kind of a, a little bit odd but um one funny thing when my buddy damien and i used to mushroom hunt uh and he is a little fluffer <laughs> he's he's been whining so i think he wanted a little attention <laughs> he's like she's she's not talking to me and she's been talking yeah. the whole time. this whole time <laughs> norm's an old man now so he needs attention <laughs> <laughs> so my buddy Damien, yeah we used to get uh snowbank mushrooms which are mushrooms that grow right at the edge of where the snow melts if you're ever in higher altitude there'll be like a webbing on the top of the snow and it's actually mycelium mats, which is really cool, um, but it helps kind of slow down some of the snow melts and um, uh, they kind of pull nutrients from that uh, as it recedes. And um, we used to eat these mushrooms that we thought were Clyptocobe glacius, and there's some whole other never really ID'd species of Clyptocobe. And we're like, yeah, they taste great. We've been eating them for three years. And the guy's like, we've never identified those. And I was like, well, they taste great. <laughs> they taste great. And I haven't died yet. So. <laughs> So that was that was like really really funny at the Colorado yeah. Mycological Society. But if you ever, if you are in Colorado, they have a wonderful mycological society. It's like twenty five or thirty bucks a year for your whole family, and it's certainly worth it. You get access to for, guided forays and all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, support your local mushroom club for sure. Absolutely, especially if you're looking into. Uh, cultivation or some of the other aspects of it there's always different workshops and things if you're unable to get to the ones that cast puts on uh, uh, you can find lots of cool local ones and you know it is it's not as difficult as people think you know uh, you know back in the day uh, we used to do everything with um uh, uh millet and coconut coir and calcium yeah uh, calcium carbonate and so in the and some coffee grinds and it worked great, you know? So oh, you can use coffee grinds. We've grown mushrooms off of popsicle sticks, hair, uh, newspapers, <laughs> you know, like also like you want to get real low tech, like you don't need a flow hood, like pop open your <laughs> oven. <laughs> yeah. It might be a little sketchy, but you can do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you can grow some mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely um yeah it it really is a lot easier and you know there was a um on that note there was a great uh, uh chat about that on hamilton pharmacopoeia the other day uh with his interview with dennis mckenna about the first book on on all the do all the cultivation on all that space so um it really is kind of an interesting uh, uh interesting thing how people think it was like so common and it really isn't it really was like the end of the 70s and that really kind of yeah. became something that was common in an everyday life for people so chris always says uh that master cho told him that korean natural farming isn't finished 
And then Chris, you know, he tells you do the things the way I'm telling you to do them. So you don't mess them up. But I always come back with natural farming isn't finished. And I like say it in a joking way, because I'm like, there are other ways to bake a cake. I know that they're not always right. And we have to follow everything, you know, to the T to make sure that we learn the right practices and all that. But I just love that concept of natural farming isn't finished because it just allows so much space for innovation. So it's like, yeah, you know, you could learn how to grow mushrooms by someone, but you can also be just intuitively kind of feel it out. There's a wealth of knowledge on YouTube. That's where I learned most of everything, you know, and then just kind of mess around until you get the right one. Oh yeah. In fact, I actually have a, a series I'm filming or about to film. I actually got the last, uh, I'm waiting on one more, but we'll, we'll add that one out later um, of a bunch of different lactobacillus methods for making labs, yeah. doing kefir based and then doing um, la- just lactobacillus starter and then using the chicken. There's a lactobacillus chicken probiotic for baby chicks that's highly available around the world because it's used to prevent pasty butt and a bunch of other common chicken diseases. But you could get that in Indonesia. Africa, like anywhere, like it's just common and, and output and huge quantities for, for the chicken and poultry industry. So it's something that's readily accessible worldwide. So I was trying to think of stuff that would be kind of, you know, uh, accessible to people, uh, no matter where you are. So we'll be comparing them. So we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll see how many days it takes to, to separate. And then we're going to throw them under the microscope. I got a new microscope. Uh, that's like the entry level Omax. It's a little bit less, not, not quite as good as my main one I use, but it's it, the whole series is going to be, okay, I want, I want to get into this. I want to make sure I'm doing it right. What I yeah. use a cheap, decent, like $300 entry level microscope that you can upgrade a little bit if you want to fuck with it later. Um, how to hook up your cell phone. Do you get a higher quality camera than most of the, the exp- you know, rather than spending a bunch of money on it, you already have a nice one on your phone, use it. Um, and then uh, how to check, double check your work. What does it look like under the microscope? You know, and, and how do these different methods compare? Which ones work, which ones don't, which ones help the plants more? So I, don't, I haven't seen anyone kind of do that kind of breakdown on it. So especially at least on the labs, everyone seems to really like labs. Yeah. So do some, some cool content on that space. So um, I'll have a, a bunch been of working that. on that for a while. Yeah. 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 I'm really excited for you to release that. You were showing me labs on spirulina. Oh, was I not supposed to say that? I don't know. Oh, no, that one's uh, fine. Yeah, I can. I love that. Here. Oh, yeah. Throw them up. Show the people. That's my favorite. I love <laughs> it. I mean, like labs on spirulina. I'm like, spirulina is going to save the world and labs is going to save the world. So you put them together. Yeah, it makes this beautiful blue. Uh, hold on. Phycocyanin. Yeah. Why can I not find them? Hold on. I got tons of pictures of it. I just need to find them. Oh, I know where they are. In fact, I think I have them basically open over here. They're right next to those mushroom pictures. Uh, but yeah, so there, it's definitely, I think, just like you're saying with the, you know, cha- further refining the labs or the, the KNF, I think that there's still a lot of room to make, to improve upon it. You know, I think there's an incredible base there. But like I said, yeah. I think there's places you can take some shortcuts and save some time on some methodologies. I know there was a um, gentleman on last week talking about um, uh, doing some different uh, uh, types of IMO that doesn't require quite as much tending um, in, in the later stages, which is really cool. Uh, so yeah. I think there's definitely some other techs that can be approved upon or combined into KNF. And we've also seen this too with the fish development. So we found that lactobacillus, oh, there it is. So the, here's some, this is really cool. I don't think we really showed this much on the show before. Yeah, I I, I'm, I told you, but I'm working on a KNF um, guidebook. So I'd love to put this in there if it's something you want to put in there. Sure. I hope yeah. I hope to release it by the festival, but we'll see. That would be awesome. Um, so this is Blue Labs, but when I scraped off most of the curds and then let it sit for the day and it, it formed looks a whole layer. So cool. It's like yeah. that's a whole that's a whole environment right there. <laughs> oh my god, I love that. Uh, let me find so the pretty picture of it all scooped out there. I have a better I mean, here's the whole bucket. It just looked incredible. Like, especially if you're into artwork, using the bacterial stuff for artwork is just so right. Neat. I'm automatically like, how cool would that look on a pair of pants? <laughs> right? Yeah, it's so sick. 
Um, but yeah, let me. I have it all skimmed out. Fuck. Here it is. This is the picture I wanted to show you. So this is gives you an idea of what goes on. So you have the curds, which is the the white stuff at the top, which is the fat, and then the blue layer below it, which is the super labs, and then the regular labs are below that. It's different densities. Um, so we take the curds and we feed those to the fish. Uh, the fish really like it. It makes the fish grow faster. It's just fat and protein. So, you know, it's good for everybody at the farm. Uh, and yeah, and we also found it kills things like E. coli. Uh, we've used it to treat E. coli, non-pathogenic non E. coli, uh, a couple of different times in vegetable facilities. So uh, I think that, again, combining these microbials and, and harvested microbials really is going to be the key to food safety long term. I think five, 10 years from now, it's going to be required that you add labs to aquaponic systems or hydroponic systems for food safety. I mean, all the innovation that you've been working on in the aquaponics space, like I just am in so much awe. I can't wait to, I I, I hope to not be too busy because I want to sit through your whole class at the festival. I'm like so excited. Every time you talk, I'm like, I got to get my notebook out because uh, Steve's going to talk about something really cool. Here's some regular labs just so people see the difference. Yeah, it looks so tasty. <laughs> yeah. And so you can actually make cheese out of the curds. Chris has a whole video on it. If you guys want to check that out, you can press it, cook it, salt it, and uh, turn it Eat into it cheese. Eat it with crackers. Super yep. bomb. Yeah. Give it to your dogs, cats, chickens, fish. Yeah, dog loves it. Yeah. Kids. <laughs> all your, Kids. All your friends. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also good too if you have a tree or, you know you have fungal diseases or root fungal diseases with any of your uh, your plants in your yard oh, here is the other picture i was looking for it just comes out this incredible blue you can't can't even the, the picture doesn't do it justice but it's just it looks so cool it's amazing you can use the blue to dye cloth as well you, you can use it if you just want to use it as a dye but yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Also high in vitamin B. A lot of people don't talk about that enough in labs. You know, there's high amounts of vitamin mm. B in it, which is a growth accelerator. So, you know, good way to speed up your plants organically. That's what we love. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, let me think. Anything else that you wanted to mention? Uh, have you had any challenges developing your different mushroom products or your company in the, in the mushroom space? Or has that been pretty, pretty easy for you? Um, I mean, nothing is without challenge. I, I feel, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I feel grateful every day. I just, I feel like this is the, I can't, I can't be thankful enough for, for the position that I'm in right now to just really work with the mushrooms and the capacity that I'm able to work with them in. And I feel like they've really allowed me the space to be able to just exist in more mental and physical freedom. So I, I don't have much to complain about. It is kind of hard though. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you have really solid formulations and things that are really helping people. And I feel like that all really starts with the best ingredients. So for me, it's been a process of like, if I can't produce it with the best ingredients possible, then, um, I'll, I'll take it off the docket. So like the ghee, for example, I only make it once a year now because that's when I'm able to get the best butter and, you know, stuff like that. Um, and none of it's FDA approved. So I do get that question quite frequently of people being like, Oh, is it safe? And I'm like, well, it's a hard question to answer, but again, just really trying to lead with education to the best of my ability and, have people be able to have the autonomy to make their own decisions around what they're putting in their body. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I had a question because my, my roommate is uh, claims to be allergic to regular portobello's. Uh, yeah. He allergic to those, but he isn't allergic to uh, chicken of the woods. Okay. Um, so are there other mushrooms. Is it just the portobello family that, that, you know, the, um, I can't remember the name of the uh, Garrick. Yeah. Garicus, yeah, I. Are there other ones that are? 
I don't know. It's really hard. I think because these classifications are still so new, like mushrooms really only um, took their own um, classification in the 50s. So there's so much that we don't even know about mushrooms as far as, you know, like their whole queendom. Um, but I, I have people come up to me, you know, and they'll be like, oh, I'm allergic to mushrooms. And a lot of the time I'm like, are you allergic to mushrooms or do you just not like the taste or are you allergic to mushrooms or are you scared that you're going to get high? So I don't know. Um, but I, I am familiar with people having an allergy to the Portobello family for sure. Um, I haven't had people, you know, come up and have such an issue with cordyceps or lion's mane, for example. It's interesting that he's okay with chicken of the woods because a lot of people have issues digesting chicken of the woods um, because it's high in sulfur. It can be high in sulfur. So um, it's fascinating that he's okay with that. Um, so, yeah, another interesting thing to think about. There's so much to learn from them. Uh, I, I know I only ever had issues when I ate entirely too many uh, um, suillus. But that's the yeah. only time issues but i ate like a grocery bag worth of soilus and in, in a, like a half a meal so or a meal yeah so. <laughs> that'll do it that'll do it <laughs> yeah that's one thing with any wild mushrooms you never want to eat more than like a half a pound in a sitting or anything like that <laughs> no and people are always like don't eat raw mushrooms and i'm on that tangent too but like i don't know my mom like she She'd randomly give me like raw shiitakes when I was younger all the time and I'd like eat them and I could still eat them and have no problem. Um, same with cordyceps. I eat cordyceps raw all, whenever I have access to them and they don't bother my stomach at all. But I don't, this is not me suggesting go eat raw mushrooms. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying everybody's body is a little bit different. I found it. How about this? Some shiitake barbecue jerky. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah good stuff well i don't want to keep you too long uh we've had you for yeah. quite a while uh, uh, appreciate you coming on um, do you want to tell everybody how to find you and uh if they want to learn more uh, let me make sure i pull up how, there we go i think i got all three of them up okay um you want to tell yeah. uh, how to find you yeah you can find me on instagram at um cassandra posey there's me um, you can also find me at cognitive function on Instagram as well, um, or cognitive function.net, uh, go peep the new website and let me know what you think. Um, if you're local to the Pacific Northwest, you can find me at the farmer's market in Ballard, um, talking about mushrooms. Um, you can also find me at my Celiate the festival out here, August 19th through the 22nd. Um, and again, if you guys are flying in from other areas and you need help with transportation from the airport to the venue, we can help arrange that. We're going to have a couple shuttles running, um, early bird tickets are up right now. Uh, so please go and support and we'd love to have you out. Um, it's going to be a beautiful weekend. So yeah. Thank you so much, Steve, for taking the time to have me on. I know that we've been trying to do this for a long time, and I'm glad that it finally aligned. Yeah, no, it was wonderful to have you on. I think we uh, educated people quite a bit today about some of the different things about maybe some medicinal mushrooms that they haven't heard of before. Uh, and maybe, you know, because people talk about so much of the other ones that are out there that uh, we're, we're avoiding intentionally because the YouTube guys <laughs> are very angry. But Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> all uh, hail the youtube gods yeah. <laughs> but uh um we'll, we'll have to do like maybe an audio version that where we talk about that or at least that just an audio form or something then we can get into that stuff absolutely uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but uh, uh definitely uh, thank you for your time to come on and uh, i definitely wanted to get you on because we haven't had anybody talk about those types of other medicines and um, i think it definitely complements the same kind of mindset that a lot of us have with cannabis and uh uh, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to help educate people. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who took the time to listen. We really appreciate your support. And we hope that you go forth and spread spores and inoculate the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, and if anybody's looking for uh, uh, inoculating their brain for more aquaponic cannabis education, they're welcome to check out uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> abmjclass.com. <laughs> That was a great segue. <laughs> sponsored, sponsored yeah. by. 
<laughs> guys, go buy tickets. Go learn more things. Collect uh, skills. <laughs> Uh, but we do cover a, a ton of different aspects of commercial and home scale aquaponic cannabis production. We have a huge library of that. We'll be doing a huge overhaul and, and update to the pest control stuff. Added a ton of insects uh, species that are, um, you know, that we've run into in commercial scale that we don't really see a lot in books and stuff like that, like lace bugs and some of the other things that aren't really being talked about yet uh, in a commercial scale. So we want to kind of make sure that you have access to the best information on that. Um, so definitely looking forward to, to that as well. So um, if you guys want to listen to follow, past episodes, we had a quick uh, Professor Q on last week. We have the wonderful uh, Mike West on uh, next week. He's uh, one of the head engineers of some of the largest extraction facilities in the United States, uh, as well as uh, the most knowledgeable cannabis extractor that I personally know. Um, so definitely a great episode. He's been on uh, once or twice before, and we're certainly excited to have him back on. And uh, don't forget to check out two weeks ago, we had Tommy Chong. So we have quite a few great episodes, past, present, and future. Uh, and we're uh, certainly looking forward to seeing you guys again soon. So uh, thanks a lot for watching. You can find us on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, all the things.